presents How to Musician with Corey Wong. Hey, Corey. Yeah. I love what you're doing. Tone's great. Timing's great. Parts are great. Something's not quite sitting right. No pressure. Let's just see where these things go. Um, All right. Yeah, sounds good. What are you thinking? Do you think you could do it a little chunkier? Like, give me some chunk. I want that Campbell's vibe. Like, you want me to change my tone, or? Mm, no, I mean, I want something. I need some some glitter. Give me some glitter on it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I understand what you're saying. Well, because what you're doing right now feels a little like this. Okay. And I want it more like this. You understand? <laughs> you want me to do that? I want you to play something provocative. Uh, okay. Corey, I want you to play something so iconic that people will remember this guitar part until the day that they die. Uh, no pressure though, huh? You know what? No, no, no. I want you to play like a dolphin. I want, no, two dolphins. I, 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 I'm a human. Yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yes, that energy, right there. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do it. Yeah, let's hit it. All right, stop. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> we got it. <laughs> Recording sessions provide a unique challenge for musicians. It can be a thankless, unseen job where the player is often expected to bring the magic after only hearing the song once or twice. Add to that the microscopic level of scrutiny a studio environment allows for, the host of different suggestions and notes people are giving you while you're doing it, and the fact that your performance will exist in recorded form literally forever once you're done with it, it's a tall order. Now that I've sugarcoated it, let's talk about Studio gigs. Today we're gonna to talk about session work. Now, the way that session work goes these days is very different than it was 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and even 10 years ago. I would argue that in the last year, 2020, session work has also changed a lot because there's a lot more remote work that's happening. So I'm gonna address that as well. The first thing to consider is how do you get session work? And I talk a little bit about this sort of thing in the how to get the gig, how to lose the gig episode. The majority of the time when I get hired to do session work, it's by a producer or the artist that's doing the album themselves. Very rarely will it be a manager of somebody that hires me to do something. It's normally the producer or the artist's decision. And for people that haven't worked on many albums before, they normally don't realize how important the role of a producer is in the sound of an album, and most cases, deciding who a lot of the personnel is involved. Because especially if it's a solo artist, they are looking to have a producer help craft the sound and the vision of the album, and the producer has their Rolodex of people that they normally would go to for stuff. So having relationships with a lot of producers is very important if you wanna get a lot of session work. Now for me, the way that I've gotten connected with a lot of producers is literally word of mouth. You don't normally audition for studio gigs and there's normally not flyers around town looking for studio musicians. It's normally a word of mouth thing because the studio environment is very demanding and it requires an extreme amount of mental focus. Sometimes an artist will hire you because maybe you played in their live band or you're friends with them or you're friends of friends and that sort of thing and they like your sound so they wanna try you out in the studio. But honestly, the majority of the time that I get hired for session work, it's from producers. A lot of people who have never done sessions before ask me, well, how can I prepare for sessions? How can I practice to get good at doing session work? Even if I've never done it before, how can I step into my first session and be really good? And that's kind of a hard thing to answer, but there are a handful of objective things that are really important in my opinion, when it comes to session work. The number one thing is mental focus. You have to be present, you have to be aware, you have to be free of distractions. 
Stay off your phone and be present. Pay attention to everything the artist is saying, the producer is saying, and everything that the people around in the room are requesting or what they're doing because you might miss one little nuanced detail that somebody talked about and then you've ruined the entire take. When it comes to the studio environment, you are being asked to record a part. Sometimes listen to a song, listen to a demo one time down, memorize the song form or make your notes. For me, I make little my own little charts. I have my own method of doing it, mostly like the Nashville number system method. But I listen down one time, make mental notes, think about the dynamic arc of the tune, think about the rhythmic momentum of a tune, and I try to come up with an idea of how I wanna craft parts that feel and sound iconic. Because most people, what they're looking for is stuff that sounds iconic and not generic. They want things that are gonna be timeless, but they want things that are going to be interesting and feel cool. So a lot of that has to do with tone, time feel, parts, all of that sort of thing. So I can't stress it enough. Your mental focus really needs to be there because you have to nail it every take. You can't be the one to mess it up. Now being asked to do something iconic and not generic and cool with great tone, great time, great feel, in tune, sounds like a daunting task to a lot of people, but it is something that you can practice. And it's something that you can get better at mostly by mental awareness. So if you're always just playing along and jamming to stuff and not thinking really hard about how your parts fit within the context of the entire song and the entire arrangement, orchestration, production of the thing, then you're just not gonna be aware of it, obviously. But the more time you spend thinking about the awareness of how does my part fit within the whole of what's going on, is what I'm playing for me on guitar, is the range of what I'm doing getting in the way of the vocals, is it getting in the way of the keyboards, or is it the thing that's carrying this section? And for me, I think about the range of notes, I think about rhythmic density, I think about tone, something that's soaring versus something that's nice and tight. There's all kinds of things that I'm thinking about on how my parts fit within a song, and that's what you need to do. Don't just play something that kind of goes along with what's happening. Make something that feels like if there was a cover band playing this song, they absolutely have to play your part when they cover it. That's how you know you've come up with an iconic part, is every time a band covers your song, they have to play your exact part. That's the goal. So as far as practicing it goes, practice writing hooks. Practice writing hooks underneath other hooks. Practice stacking hooks on top of other hooks into other sections that are hooks on hooks on hooks. Because that way you'll learn to weave melodic structures in and out of each other and rhythmic structures in and out of each other. Sometimes the producer is gonna ask you to do something really weird Sometimes the artist will ask you to do something really abstract and they might explain it not in musical terms. They'll say, play something more blue or play something that feels more like waves in the ocean rather than tires on the gravel. And I want more like this. Your job as a studio musician is to understand in musical terms what the emotion is what the context is of the vision that they have for this song and try to bring it to life on your instrument. One of the things that you can do to really analyze yourself is during playback. If you've just done a take, everybody's gone into the control room, you're listening back to what you just did. Think about how your part plays within the context of the whole thing. Now that you're not actually playing it, does it really fit within the context of the song that you thought it did while you were playing it? Or is there something that you can maybe adjust? Think about those things and always have a relentless pursuit to make the perfect part for the song. Don't be lazy. The other thing is during playback, producers, artists, engineers, all the musicians are listening to so many different things during the playback. They might not know exactly where everybody made little mistakes. So it can be really helpful for you to remember exactly where you made a timing mistake or a note mistake or even just an intonation thing. You can say, oh, bar three of the bridge, I played a G flat instead of a G, punch me in there or ah, pull it from a different take there. That sort of stuff is invaluable and the producers and engineers will definitely thank you for that. So pay attention. When you do make mistakes, let it be known because it's okay to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes at some point. Just make sure that you communicate it so 
That way a producer or engineer isn't wasting time trying to figure out, ah, why did this section sound weird? You could really help that process along by just saying, ah, that was me, bar three of verse two, I messed up. And the other thing is, sometimes you're gonna have an opinion on what you think should be done and how your part should play within the context of the song, and the producer or artist might have a completely different thing that they're looking for. It's your job to get rid of your own ego and listen to what they have to say and try to follow what their vision is. It's of course okay for you to express your opinion and maybe lobby for a certain thing that you have in mind, but at the end of the day, it's not about you and it's about the artist's vision and the producer's vision of what's happening. But at the same time, they are hiring you because you are a professional and you are good at your craft and they probably respect what you do, so that's why they've hired you and it's okay to share your opinion as well. Just make sure that you're respectful about it. Now, a lot of time there is going to be a session leader beyond just the producer or the artist. And that kind of helps because if everybody is in a leadership role, it just gets to be too many cooks in the kitchen. So sometimes people just default into roles in the studio, but my suggestion would be to feel out what the producer, artist, and other musicians are kind of expecting and what the interaction is like between everybody and what your interaction is like with them, not only on a professional level, but a human level. And sometimes you might be the one to kind of call the shots on certain things. Other times somebody else will be kind of the session leader within the thing. And that's okay. That actually in a lot of ways kind of helps the flow of things because it's like a team captain. There's a coach, there's a team captain, and it's like the organization as a whole. You know, so maybe the the artist is the organization team as a whole, the producer is the coach, and there might be a captain of the team who's like the session leader, the one kind of helping calling the shots on the court, so to speak. So your role in the studio, it's important to just kind of see how you fit what the group dynamic is and not to disrupt the thing too much. Because in the end, it's all about making a great record and it doesn't really matter who's the leader on it. It's just whether you guys made something that's worth listening to or not. Phil Devinsinski, one of the most prolific session guitar players to have ever lived. Over 600 combined albums, 54 top 40 hits, countless hours of studio time. Phil shaped the Minneapolis sound of the 1970s. Producers called him inhuman, out of this world. Well, tonight we ask the question, what if they were right? First-hand accounts differ wildly on the appearance of Phil Devinsinski. Some fellow musicians report the creature being over seven feet tall. This, the only known photograph of the player outside of a studio setting, shows just a blur. A shadowy figure holding a Stratocaster. This footprint was taken from wet sidewalk cement just outside of Sound 80 Studios. Our expert crypto musicologists suggest that Devin Sinsky was likely bipedal and may have been covered in a thick, coarse hair. To this day, Devin Sinsky hunters still roam the forests and lakefronts of Minneapolis. Tracking. Waiting. Listening. The other side of session work that I wanna talk about is just the general professionalism thing. Show up on time. Show up early. Show up with gear that works. What gear do you need to bring to sessions? That all depends on who you're working with, why they're hiring you, what they're hiring you for. So for me, at this point, most of the time, I try to get as much information as I can up front. What types of stuff is the artist interested in? What types of stuff is the producer interested in? What's, what kind of work have they done? Why would they hire me instead of somebody else to come in? What do I bring to the table that they're looking for? So, are they looking for a Stratocaster sort of thing? Are they looking for an acoustic thing? Are they looking for a really modern sound or a really vintage sound? That matters because if it's somebody who's looking for a really vintage vibe and you show up with a really modern sounding guitar and a futon frame for a pedal board and you show up with a modeling amp, they're probably not gonna like that as much as if you just showed up with 
a handful of nice guitars and a couple of old amps, that's what they're looking for, cool. But sometimes people want the latest, greatest, coolest gadgets and they're impressed by, ooh, what's that nice little pedal? Or, ooh, what's that cool looking new pedal? I've never seen that before. You must be the guitar player that's all hip to the new stuff going on in the world. Whatever, different producers, different artists look for different things and that's okay. Neither one of them is good or bad or better or worse. Everybody just has their preferences. And I think it's important for us as studio musicians to understand what people are looking for and try to deliver the best service that we can for them. And within that service, it's our taste, it's our decisions on gear, it's our decisions on how we conduct ourselves in the session. Are we somebody who's gonna help bring the vibe of the room up? So when it comes time to hit take nine or take 10 and the energy feels down, are you gonna be the one in the room to kind of make sure that everybody's still feeling in it and making it feel like it's still take one? Or are you gonna be the one that says, come on, let's go, I'm sick of this, I wanna go home. Cause that might kill the vibe in the room and that's gonna mess with the whole thing. So it's on every person in the room to make sure that it feels like the most creatively welcoming and warm environment that it can be because that's where the best art is going to happen. The other thing that's really important that you can just practice by listening and paying attention is taste. This is something that not a lot of people talk about, but it's a big part of why session musicians get hired for certain things. Your taste in music, your taste in what you think is appropriate, tone-wise, rhythm-wise, groove-slash-pocket-wise, and just part-wise. If somebody says they want you to take a guitar solo, there's such a wide spectrum of what that can mean. But it's up to your taste to interpret what they mean when they say they want a guitar solo on a certain type of song. When they say they want something high energy, heavy, your taste is going to interpret where you put that on the spectrum of heavy versus soft or clean is a huge part of how you can prepare yourself for sessions because understanding a producer's taste or an artist's taste that you're working for will give you a better understanding of what target you should try to aim at to please the client. And I think it goes without saying, but make sure that you show up at the session with gear that works. Make sure that your stuff is put together, clean, isn't super noisy, doesn't have obnoxious problems with it because time in the studio is money. Artists, producers, they're paying a lot of money to get a lot of people together for one project. Don't be the one to mess it up because your gear doesn't work. Now, one thing that's come up a lot in the last decade is remote session work. I do a ton of remote session work, especially starting in the year 2020, it seems like everybody just was forced to get their remote game working. And I actually have a remote rig that I bring with me on tour all the time. And I just have it with me kind of everywhere that I go. Cause sometimes I'll get asked to do sessions or get asked to play on albums and I'm on tour or I'm out somewhere else. And it's nice to just be able to have my little UA Apollo, plug that into my computer, have my guitar, and I can just do guitar tracks anywhere I'm at. That's awesome. And that is really fun because you get a little more time to craft your parts. It's actually, it's a good and it's a bad thing because you don't get the immediate feedback in the room. Sometimes you can go down a rabbit hole of a certain direction as far as the parts that you send and you spent all this time on it and the artist or producer writes you back immediately like, ah, that's not what we had in mind at all. Where if you were in the session, they might've been able to tell you that 30 seconds into trying the idea. So that can be one thing that you have to consider, but that's also why whenever I'm doing remote work, I try to get as much information as possible up front. What kind of reference do you have for this song? What are you looking for from me? What roles are not being filled right now that are going to be fulfilled later? Did you send this to me and a keyboard player? So I do also have to leave room for them when I'm making my parts, or is it just, this is it, and I'm the final thing to get added onto this tune? Either way is fine, you just have to take those things into consideration. 
For me, what I normally like to do is get as much information as I can up front, but then also give a handful of different options. Not an overwhelming amount, because sometimes if a producer gets 20 guitar tracks, they're just gonna open it up. Uh, I don't know how all this stuff fits together. And if that is the case, just make sure that you explain to them what they are. And please, please make sure you label your files correctly and that they're organized and that they all line up from the same spot. Because if a producer or an artist has to pull in files, it's like, oh yeah, this audio file started at verse one, but this one started at the beginning of the song. And this one started at beat three of the second pre-chorus. It's, it's way too confusing. So make sure when you're sending files to consolidate them, make it really easy so poof, all the files line up at the exact same spot, preferably the exact same spot of the file that the producer sent you because they're gonna know where they bounced their file from most likely and they can just line up your tracks to that. Because the producer or artist wasn't there in the room with you, you have to be okay with revisions. That's just part of the remote thing. Sometimes you're gonna send something, they're gonna look for something else and you have to go back and forth. You have to record a couple things later. Okay, send it back, uh, the, try this sort of thing. Uh, play the exact same part, but just on a different tone. And you go back and forth and do that sort of thing. That's fine, that's just part of remote work. And as far as sending files, I normally use Dropbox because I have an account but people use WeTransfer or Box.com or sometimes Google Drive. Although Google Drive is kind of weird because it has this zip thing that it has to do to every file before it downloads. And I don't know how they haven't quite figured that one out yet, but there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Just make it really easy. The key to this whole thing is just making it easy for the producer or artist. When they get your tracks, they line up, they sound great and they can slide right into the project and that's how you're gonna get more and more remote session work. And the final thing that I wanna talk about regarding session work is expectations. Most of the time, you are being expected to come up with iconic parts in time, in tune, with great groove, with great feel, that feel cool, that feel timely and timeless at the same time. That's the expectation and you need to somehow Find it within you to deliver. And not only to deliver, but deliver on the first and the second and the 27th take, if you must. So it's a tough task, but nothing in the music industry is easy anymore. And it never has been in this sort of thing. So you really do have to have your musicianship together. That is a complete given. The expectation in the remote world is that you turn your stuff around in a timely manner. If somebody says, hey, I need a couple guitar tracks really quick, that doesn't mean two months from now you send them the thing back. And maybe you want to do it, but you can't get to it until next week. Just make sure that you tell them that. I would love to be a part of this project, but I can't do it until next week. Is that okay? Maybe it is and they'll get you. Maybe not and they'll find somebody else. That's totally fine. <laughs>